beyond all measure. Rejoice. 
much that you arrested death, Lord. And we thank you so much that you brought us here to this place as a people um, to come and worship you and for giving us that freedom. And I pray that we would worship you with all our hearts as we go throughout today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Why don't you guys all stand up and greet someone around you quick. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the dark is shining. Jesus, Grace. 
Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise on the valley and praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure and praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water my enemies drown in. As long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to praise the Lord, all oh my soul. I'll praise when I feel it and praise when I don't. I'll praise cause I know you're still in control. Cause my praise is the weapon, it's more than a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. And I won't be quiet, my God is alive. And how could I keep it inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul. You're sovereign, I'll praise cause you reign, I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, I'll praise cause you're faithful, I'll praise cause you're true, I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than you, I'll praise cause you're sovereign, I'll praise cause you reign, and praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, I'll praise cause you're true, I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, and praise the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord, oh my soul, I'm gonna praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? And I won't be quiet, my God is alive, and how could I keep it inside? I won't be quiet, my God is alive, and how could I keep it inside? I'm gonna praise the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, 
have a word of prayer together shall we father in heaven thank you so much for this uh, beautiful day that you've given to us and lord we've uh, gathered here to to worship you to honor you to praise you lord we pray that we would continue to do that from the depths of our heart here this morning father we're just uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here grateful for each one who has come those that are still traveling Bless them with safety, Lord, and uh, as we've been singing this morning, open our hearts, open our minds, uh, help us to, to sense you, to feel you, and to allow your Holy Spirit to work in us and through us here this morning. God, we, we come here uh, as needy people, each and every one of us. We have our own personal needs, we have our needs as a congregation, and, and God, we know that only you can meet those needs, so... We would ask that you would do that here today to fill us, to mold us, to shape us, to convict us, uh, whatever is necessary, God, that you would do that work in our hearts, in our lives here today. And again, Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and we look forward to what you continue to do here this morning in our presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And good morning, Christian greetings to each one of you. Special welcome to our visitors this morning. Good to see you here with us. Uh, if you haven't noticed, there's some empty benches up here in the front uh, for those that are in the back. If you'd like to move up, you're welcome to. It's the air conditioning works better up here, actually, if you've never sat up here, so if that helps. Uh, but that's because our youth group uh, had left this morning for uh, a mission trip out to Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they left here about 8 o'clock, a little bit after 8, so my guess is they're probably about at the throughway. Uh, by now, headed headed in that direction. So I want to take just a moment right now to pray for them. Uh, we prayed for them this morning before they left, but I'd like to pray uh, as a congregation. So could we do that this morning? Let, let's pray specifically for them. God, this morning we, we thank you for our youth group and our youth leaders, sponsors, and youth pastor. And Lord, we just uh, we pray your special blessing on them now as they're traveling. Lord, it's a, it's a lot of fun to travel like that, but God, we, we pray your physical protection over them. Uh, the, the truck and trailer and the, and the three vans that are on the road, that you would just protect them. Pray that everything uh, mechanically works as it should. There's no issues, no problems. Uh, we pray as well against any uh, sickness or anything like that that uh, would, would hinder the trip or hinder any of the, uh, the, the leaders or the youth uh, on this trip and uh, that they'd have a, just a, a, a protected trip and even the drivers around them. And Father, as they spend this time at uh, City Mission there and out in Ohio in the Columbus area, that you would just uh, work in them, uh, first of all, Lord, just to continue to tug at their hearts and their lives. Help them to know that you do truly love them, you care for them, you have uh, gifted them with, with gifts and abilities, uh, many of them with, with things that they don't even realize are there, but I pray that they would be exposed in this uh, mission setting and that you would encourage them along those lines to, to help others to know you, help others to know Jesus. And uh, Father, just uh, it would be a wonderful time for them. Uh, in their hearts and in their lives, and we, we pray for the people that they will be coming into contact with, Lord, that as well, that they would, they would see your love through the youth group and through the leaders, and uh, just bless all the relationships there as they travel together and as they 
uh, word together, and as they travel back again at the end of the week, just uh, bless them and, and make them a blessing. Also pray for the families here at home, Lord. It's, it's hard as parents sometimes to, to see your child off like that. There's some, you know, some, maybe some worry, some anxiety about how everything will go, but Lord, just to calm those fears, those nerves. Help them to know that you will take care of them and pray for siblings as well at home who uh, may be a bit lonely or just, just different without uh, brothers and sisters at home. And uh, again, just to know that you are a sovereign God and uh, that you will watch over them. So bless them and again and make them a blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll invite you to open your Bibles to uh, the book of Romans chapter 6 this morning for our devotional. Romans chapter 6, and I'll begin this by asking you the question this morning, are you dead? (laughs) Are you dead? We, uh, in just a couple weeks, have a baptismal service planned, Bob and Karen Rose's Pond, on the 21st of July, and there's going to be several young people uh, who are going to model dying uh, for us. They're not going to drown in the pond, but they're going to model spiritually dying, what's happened in our hearts and our lives. And I trust as we go through this passage here this morning that each one of us can say as well this morning that I'm, I'm dead. I've died. So let's begin reading Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who then, who then who, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. We'll stop there. I asked the question this morning, are you dead? Because if we're not dead, then we're not free. We all like freedom, right? We like freedom. We want to be free. We enjoy the freedoms that our country gives us, and we want to be free in Christ. We, talking, we, we talk about being free in Christ, but we can't really be free unless we're dead. Dead to sin, dead to self, dead to those things. And it's easy to go through life being half dead, <laughs> being half dead, still hanging on to some of those things instead of completely giving up, completely dying to self. Dying is not fun. Dying is not easy. Dying is hard. But if we're truly going to be free in Christ, if we're truly going to live the abundant life that Jesus has for us and be free, totally free, that can't happen until we're dead. So the challenge to me as I read this and as I share with you this morning is, am I truly dead? (laughs) Am I dead? Am I dead to sin? Have I died to those things? Have I crucified the flesh and those things that are in it. And when we do that, when we allow God to do that work in our hearts and in our lives, he frees us. We can live in freedom. We can live in joy. We can live the abundant life that he has for us. Let's pray, shall we? Father, this morning is just so grateful uh, for the work that uh, Jesus, you did on the cross for us. You took the penalty of our sin. You, you clothed us in your righteousness. And Lord, when we recognize our sinfulness as human beings and accept you as Savior and Lord of our lives and and crucify ourselves, your word tells us, to die to sin, to die to self, which means to totally give it over to you and to turn from that, to repent and turn from that. Lord, that you give us a freedom that, that cannot come in any other way. We are slaves to sin. We're slaves to ourselves until we die to that and are crucified in that manner. So God, this morning, I pray that as you speak to our hearts and to our minds this morning, if there's an area in our lives or something that we're holding on to that that we think is giving us life, 
and it's not. It's actually causing pain. It's causing, you know, just heartache. It's causing all kinds of things. Help us, Lord, to, to crucify that thing in our flesh, to be able to repent, to ask forgiveness for that thing, and, Lord, to walk in the freedom that you have for us. Father, we thank you so much that you're a God of love, a God who cares about us, and a God who has provided that freedom that we can enjoy. So, Father, bless us as we continue to worship you here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For 532, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. He yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great, O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Okay, then. So next one, how about we go to number 541. Marvelous Grace, number 541. Mm. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. 
Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. Thank you. Well, good morning. It is good to be here this morning. It's good to be with you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, to be able to sing His praises and to be a part of what He's doing and hearing about what He's doing. And I am super excited for the youth, for what they're going to be able to experience and what they're going to be able to do this week, uh, and just the way that God's going to stretch them and use them and, and push them to get to know Him better. And like we talk about, knowing Jesus and making Jesus known. Doing both of them at the exact same time. I am excited for that. And Derek, I find it interesting. Uh, you came up this morning and you said you know, that you didn't have time to put some together and, and you were kind of apologizing for the flow. And I thought those two songs were absolutely perfect. And the flow was perfect and they, they hit the message that I want to share perfectly. So I believe you were led by the Holy Spirit to pick both of those songs this morning. I'm going to take a, a Sunday off uh, again. Last time I preached was Father's Day, and I was able to preach a sermon to the men in the congregation. Uh, and then as I was getting ready to do this next sermon, getting ready in, in 1 Corinthians, kind of going through it, and I had a good chunk of it going and, and ready to go. The outline was done, and I was ready to go. And, and I did not feel like this Sunday was the Sunday for that. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was leading me in another direction. And I have been trying much, uh, much more uh, diligently to listen to the Holy Spirit in my preparation for preaching. Uh, it's easy, especially as you get into a book, to walk through the whole thing, and you can do it methodically, and you can kind of get in a rhythm. You know where you're going next, and you know what you're going to hit next, and then you just completely forget that the Holy Spirit sometimes says, no, wait a minute, I got something else. I want you to share something else. And I felt that very, very presence and very, uh, I guess, clearly in my preparation this week. And I felt like the Lord was leading me in a different direction. And as scary as that is sometimes when you're kind of used to doing the same thing and walking through the same thing, uh, when I get an opportunity to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, I need to take advantage of it. So I'm going to do that this morning. I want to bring a message today on forgiveness. Forgiveness. And uh, the forgiveness that I want to talk about this morning is not brother to brother or sister to sister forgiveness. Not something that you extend or receive from somebody else who's hurt you or offended you. It is a forgiveness that is completely and utterly not deserved. It's completely and utterly given to us by no merit or no work of our own. The message this morning, the title of this message is all about forgiveness. We're going to be looking at the forgiveness that God gives us through Jesus, through Christ. You know, we think about sometimes, we talk about 
You know, we, get it, we, we, we know that language and we kind of know that, that, that phrase that we use, that, you know, the Christianese when we talk about forgiveness and we say, you know, it just feels like the Lord lifted a burden from me or He took a weight off of my shoulders when He forgave me of my sins. And too often, and I feel maybe I'm speaking to myself, but I don't think so. Too often we, we, we put that phrase back at salvation, we use that phrase back at the point when we became saved. That that point, God took that burden off of me. And we forget about what He does from that point until now. So I want to talk about forgiveness this morning. One of the dangers of this topic is specifically from forgiveness is that it can be very familiar. It can be a topic that we, we heard about a lot, we know a lot about, or we think we know a lot about. And in a lot of things in life, the things that we are, are most closely in proximity to or that we talk about the most, we become the most familiar with and therefore we take for granted the most. And I think probably our best example of that is in our marriage relationships. It's very easy to take our spouse or our family to, for, for granted because we're with them all the time. We know when we wake up, they're going to be here. We know when we go to bed, we're going to be, they're going to be there. We know when we go to work, they're there as well. And they're, they're just expected to be there. And, and sometimes this concept of forgiveness can be that same line of thinking. We can think, well, it, it, we just expect it. It's normal. It's kind of just what we, we talk about. It's what we think about. But I think sometimes we need to stop and take a look at a topic like forgiveness with fresh eyes and really appreciate what God has done for us. So today we're going to look at four aspects of God's forgiveness and, and hopefully bring this topic to the front and center of our minds and our lives for the week coming up and, and hopefully for a longer time frame than that. But the first aspect of forgiveness I want to look at this morning is that for the forgiveness that God gives is given in its freeness. And we see this, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 19 through 26. We're going to be jumping around to different verses today. I don't have one text that we're going to be walking through, but we're going to be looking at a number of verses. Each one of these points will have at least one verse or a few of them that we're going to look at, and we're going to look at what this, this whole idea of forgiveness is. And the first one is its freeness. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Paul writes this, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been made manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe... There, are, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and for all have fallen short of the glory of God and are, are, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now this text alone, there is a whole set of messages. What an amazing text in, in really fleshing out this concept of what it looks like to be forgiven of our sins. But what I want to pull out of this text and really look at deeply is the fact that in Christ, our forgiveness is free. It's free. You have done absolutely nothing to earn it. You've done absolutely nothing to deserve it. It's been given to you freely. And it says here in verse 24 that we are justified by His grace as a gift. Again, the song that Derek led, marvelous grace. The wondrous grace of our glorious Lord. Now just because forgiveness is a free gift doesn't mean that it didn't cost anything. You know, I've always heard the phrase, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's the same thing that's true about forgiveness. The forgiveness that we see, receive through God in Christ was not a free price. It didn't cost nothing. 
And it's super clear here at the end of verse 24 and into verse 26 that it was the costliest of prices that needed to be paid so that we could have access to it freely. It says in verses 24 through 26, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 25, this is the key to this whole text, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his Christ's blood to be received by faith. To be received by faith. You see, the forgiveness that you have cost Jesus everything. Everything. It cost him excruciating pain. It cost him his life. And most importantly, and I think the one that was the hardest for Christ to bear, was that it cost Jesus his sinless position before the Father on the cross. When he looked at his Father and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was because of the weight of the sin, the fact that Christ became sin for us, that God could not look at him. That God could not, he could not be in the presence of his Father And there's a word in this section that we don't use very often in our culture today, and it can tend to be used specifically in the church, but I think it really needs to be understood, and that is the word propitiation. Propitiation. Now, what does this mean? What does this word mean? Well, simply put, propitiation means the turning away from anger by the offering of a gift. It's the turning away from anger by the offering of a gift. Of a gift. So when the Bible says that God put Jesus forward as a propitiation, it's saying that Jesus was the gift offered to satisfy the anger of God towards sin and towards sinners. Towards sin and towards sinners. And yes, God is angry with sin, and God is angry with sinners. He is. John chapter 3, verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God becomes upon the sons of disobedience. We're seeing a direct correlation between the wrath of God in the person. Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up for yourself wrath on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Brothers and sisters, God isn't just angry at sin. His wrath also falls upon sinners. When people are sent to eternal damnation, it's not the sin that goes there. It's the person. It's the soul. However, the joy of what Jesus has done is the fact that we do not have to experience that wrath. We don't have to experience that eternal wrath because Jesus took it upon himself on the cross in our place. The wrath of God, the full wrath of God upon the shoulders of a sinless, perfect sacrifice in our place. What an amazing, amazing gift that we have. And in turn, in all of that, Jesus then offers us a free gift of forgiveness. It cost him everything. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to work for it. We don't get to inherit it. We only must receive it. All we have to do is receive it. When you give a gift, there's always a giver and a receiver. And it will always cost the giver something And it will always take a receiver to take it. There's no other way around it. I can take a gift and I can put it on the, you know what, as a matter of fact, we're going to do that this morning. I have a gift. I can take a gift this morning and I can set it right here on this 
this bottom step, and I can just leave it there. It's still a gift. I still gave it, but nobody is here to receive it. I haven't given it to anybody. Nobody has actually taken that gift from my hands and possessed it personally. But I want to do that this morning. So I need some young person to want to volunteer to receive a gift. Is there any child or young person? I got one right there. It was really quick to raise your hand. Come on up. I'm going to give you a gift this morning. I wrapped it personally. That's why it doesn't look the greatest. My daughter, Maya, said this morning, Dad, it's like ripping all over the place. I said, that's fine. The paper comes off anyways. It's not that big of a deal. But I want to give you a gift this morning, and I want you, I don't want to give it to you quite yet, because it's really important to me. There's a lot of things in here that I really enjoy. Okay, So for me to give you this gift, it's going to take me offering something from myself that's important, and you receiving it. Are you okay with doing that? Okay. You can have the gift. You can go back to your seat. I don't want you to open it in church. Wait till you get home, and then you can open it and then enjoy it. But in life, and especially in salvation, I think the concept that we lose a lot of times is that, you know, we just deserve this forgiveness. You know, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I deserve that forgiveness because of what I've done. That is not the gift of forgiveness. That is not the freeness that Christ offers in his forgiveness. The freeness he offers is the fact that he did all the work, and he's giving it to us as a gift but we must receive it. It doesn't just sit on the front bench and not get received. If that's the case, it's not a gift. It's not a given gift, and it's not given freely. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, the free gift of God, not that it was free and cost him nothing, but the free gift he gives us is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we access that eternal life through forgiveness through forgiveness. The second aspect of forgiveness I want to look at is its fullness. We looked at its freeness, and I want to look at its fullness. If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, passage of scripture that really fleshes out what the fullness of forgiveness looks like. Paul writes here, he says, and you, who are dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him." Brothers and sisters, not only is our forgiveness given to us freely as a gift, but it is also a forgiveness that is full. It is full. Martin Luther, uh, the reformer, experienced a, a dream, and he experienced the reality of this truth in a dream one night. I found this as I was studying for this message. I found it incredibly interesting. But in this dream, he was visited by Satan. He was standing in front of Satan, and And Satan brought him a record of his life, and it was all written with Martin Luther's own hand. Everything in these these scrolls or in these books were written by Martin Luther's own hand. And Satan said to him, is it true? Did you write this? And Luther, obviously terrified in this dream, confessed, yes, it's true. All of what's in these scrolls is true, and yes, I did write them. So scroll after scroll were unrolled. And the same confession was given from him time and time again. Yes, they are true. I did this. I wrote this. And at length, the evil one, Satan, decided that he was getting ready to leave. He had brought Luther down to his lowest of lowest depths. Luther had felt defeated, he felt beaten, and he felt like Satan had him. Suddenly, In his dream, Luther turned to Satan and said, it is true, every word of it is true. But right across all of these scrolls, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Even though that was just a dream, there's a lot of truth in it. There's a lot of truth in it. And Paul writes here that once 
We were dead in our sin, in our works. He writes that very clearly. Myron talked about it this morning. His devotions couldn't go any more perfect with these next few points. That we were dead in our sin and in our works. Then, God performs a miraculous spiritual surgery. A spiritual surgery in which not only does he give us a new heart and new desires, but he actually resurrects us from the dead. He pulls us out of our death and declares that every sin that we have committed is forgiven. Every single one. Every single one. And if that doesn't get your blood going, there is nothing that will. The fact that Jesus Christ declares us righteous, fully righteous, not partially righteous, not you're going in the right direction righteous, not you might get there someday righteous, you are fully forgiven from your sin. And there is nothing that Satan can accuse you of that isn't covered completely by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I will say this very clearly, that if you are being accused, and if you feel like you're being attacked over sin that you have committed, that you have given to Christ and is covered under the blood of Jesus, it is not Jesus that's telling you this. It's the enemy. Look at verse 14. This record of debt. There's a record of debt. Each one of us has a record of debt. And we had a record of debt that was against a holy, just God. It's, a, it's our sin against a holy and just God. And then he moves on and he talks about the legal demands of that. And what is the legal demands of our sin? It's death. It's death. This is what we all deserve and this is what we all should get. We deserve, this is what we deserve. Paul makes it very clear. But God, and you find this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. And this grace and forgiveness is full, with no limits and with no boundaries. Now, there's a whole other sermon that goes along with this point, but it's not going to get preached today. And Paul addresses this back in Romans, where he talks about not sinning so that grace can abound. This forgiveness and fullness does not give us a, an excuse to continue doing wrong things because, well, we're just going to be forgiven. That's not the case. And that's not what he's talking about here, and that's not what I'm trying to get across. I'm trying to get across to the point that if you've asked Christ into your heart, if he is your Lord and Savior, his forgiveness of your sins is complete. It's complete. It's in full. There's nothing more that you need to do. There's no other boxes you need to check. It's done. It's complete. It's full. So that when the enemy attacks you, and when he's telling you that you're a worthless sinner who can't do anything right, and when you're trying to beat sin, and you fail and you fall, you can go ahead and tell him, you're right. I am a worthless sinner. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses me from all my sin. You can say that, and you can say it confidently. The third aspect of forgiveness that I want to look at is its certainty. And that's found in 1 John chapter 1. If you want to turn to 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, we're going to spend the next couple points are going to be in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. The certainty of our forgiveness says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All of it. One of the biggest hurdles I think that we have to get over sometimes as a Christian is whether or not we are really forgiven or if we, when we confess, if it actually does anything or if we just feel better. If we just feel better. Is there an actual effectiveness to our asking for forgiveness? There's a story about a, a young boy who was at his grandparents' house and he actually accidentally killed his grandmother's pet duck. He hit it with a rock from a slingshot, and the boy was just shooting slingshots around, and the duck happened to be in the way, and the slingshot ricocheted off a tree, hit the duck in the head, and killed the duck. 
The boy felt really bad for what he did, so he also felt very guilty, so he buried the, the duck in the backyard, and he didn't tell anybody. He thought, well, maybe she won't notice, and, and, and maybe I don't have to tell her, and just a lot of guilt and a lot of burden on him, so he just buried the duck. Later on, a couple days later, he found out that, the boy, that his sister had seen the whole thing. She knew what happened, she knew exactly what he did, and she saw him bury the duck, and she knew exactly what was going to happen if it was turned into his grandmother. So she had leverage over this, and like every good sibling does, they're going to use it to their advantage. And whenever the sister, it was the sister's turn to wash the dishes, or take out the garbage, or wash the car, she would just whisper in his ear, remember that duck? And the boy would gladly oblige and take over doing the dishes, or taking out the garbage, or washing the car, and he would do whatever his little sister said. And there is at some point, a limit to that kind of stuff. And finally, this boy had had enough. He was done. He's like, you know what? It's got to be better than just doing what my sister tells me to do all the time. It's got to be better than having her lord it over me constantly. So he went to his grandmother, and he was obviously very scared and very fearful. This was a few weeks after he had done this, and he confessed to his grandmother what he'd done. And to his surprise, she gave him a big hug, and she thanked him. She said, I was actually standing in the kitchen sink and I was standing at the kitchen sink and I saw the whole thing. I saw you kill the duck. I saw you bury the duck. And at that point, when you did it, I forgave you. Okay, I forgave you right then and there. I was just wondering when you were going to get sick and tired of your sister's blackmail and finally come to me. And as funny and as cute as that little story is, there's a lot of truth in this when it comes to our relationship with the, the forgiveness that Jesus offers us in Satan's constant attack on our life. He knows that we've done wrong. He knows that we're evil sinners and that we like to sin, that it's our flesh's desire to sin. And he lords it over our lives and tells us consistently, remember what you did. Remember what you did. God's holy. He's perfect. He's just. He doesn't need to forgive you, and he shouldn't forgive you. And he's right But when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, that's a truth in the word of God. It is not a question. It's not an opinion. It is a truth. And we can claim it as such. Psalms 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. What a joy We can be 100% confident, 100% confident that every time we ask Jesus to forgive us, that he will do it. And he won't just do it to forgive them, but he also takes those sins and he removes them from his presence as far as the east is from the west. In other words, he forgets them. He forgets them. Jesus keeps no record of wrong when it's under his blood. You see, God's forgiveness is not like ours. Not in the least sense. If Myron was going to come up here this morning and he'd come up on stage and if he just gave me a good slap across the face, I would probably be a little shocked. You guys would probably be a little shocked. There'd be a little bit of a little kind of a what's going on here. Myron could stand up here right after he did and say, oh, I'm sorry, Greg, I really didn't mean to hurt you. I mean, that just was an impulse, and I just did it. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I probably would forgive Myron. It would be a little hard. My face would hurt. There'd be a sting from it. But I can guarantee you the next time Myron walked up to me and he raised his hand, I'm probably flinching, or I'm probably putting my hands up, because I'm thinking the last time he did that, he hit me. So I can forgive Myron, but it's not in my nature, and it's certainly not in my ability to forget what he's done to me, to forget the pain that he's caused me. We as humans do possess the ability to forgive, and I trust that we do that regularly. However, our our capacity to forget is much, much smaller. But when Jesus forgives us, when we confess to him, what we've done, he does forgive us, and not only forgives us, but he forgets them. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? Isn't Jesus all-knowing? 
Doesn't he know everything? Why does he do this? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Because he is faithful and just. He keeps his promises and he knows what he knows and he knows what he needs us to do. And praise God for his faithfulness and his justice. The last aspect of forgiveness that I want to look at together this morning is its eternity. Is its eternity. And this kind of piggybacks off of the last point. If you flip your Bible over a couple pages to 1 John chapter 5, just a couple pages over, verses 10 through 13, we see this very clearly. John writes, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe in God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony as born concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Verse 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why? So that you may know that you have eternal life. The forgiveness we receive from Christ does not just benefit us in the here and now. Yes, it's good to know that when we sin against a holy God, he forgives us. He forgives us fully, and he forgives us with a certain aspect. But it's also eternal. It's an eternal forgiveness as well. When he talks about as far as the east is from the west, there's an eternality to that. They never meet. You can go as far east, you can go as far west, they're never going to come back together. There's an eternality to the forgiveness of of God. It doesn't wear off and it doesn't fade with time. Jesus doesn't just forgive us today and, and hopefully over time it stays forgiven. No, Jesus forgives us eternally. When we ask for forgiveness for our sins, they are gone forever. They are gone forever. It's as fresh and new today as it was when he shed his blood on the cross. And guess what? Guess what? It's never remembered, and it's never brought back up by him to your account. Never. It's gone. It's gone, it's removed, and it's never coming back. It's kind of like, and, and probably the, it's a poor way to describe it, but it's the only way I could think of. It's kind of like when you have a calculator in your hand, and you're typing in numbers, and you're trying to get to the right answer, and you, you hit times, and then you do the next number, and you hit the wrong number and you hit clear. What's it do to those numbers? They're gone. You can't get them back. There's no way to get those same exact numbers that you just typed in back. They're gone forever. And that's really an illustration of what Jesus does when, we hit the, when he hits the clear button on our sins. They are gone forever, eternally. Never to come back on your account. Corey Ten Boom says this about the eternal nature of God's forgiveness. And if anybody knew and anybody has heard of the story of Corey Ten Boom, you know she understood forgiveness to a deep extent. She said this God takes our sins, the past, the present, and the future, and then dumps them into the sea. And then he puts up a sign that says, No fishing allowed. No fishing allowed. And what a concept for us to grasp. Brothers and sisters, we can live a life of victory if we understand forgiveness. If we're not constantly battling our own thoughts and memories of what's been going on and we understand that Jesus Christ has forgiven us our sins freely, in full, with certainty, and eternally, when we understand that, we can live a life of victory. But we must have a biblical understanding of forgiveness in Christ. It cannot be based solely on our human understanding of forgiveness or even on our feelings of forgiveness. You know, there's sometimes we ask for forgiveness for things and even in human relationships and you're like, I really don't feel forgiven. You know, I asked them for forgiveness but they didn't really sound real like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. It didn't really sound like they forgave me. It's not like that with Christ. When we ask God to forgive us our sins, he does it. He does it completely. And he does it perfectly. But you know what? 
You don't have that forgiveness if you don't know his son. It's impossible. You can work your entire life. You can think you're doing the right thing. You can even ask for forgiveness from God, but if you don't know his son, if it's not his son's blood that has forgiven you of your sins, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You need the blood of Jesus Christ. You need to realize, first and foremost, that you are a sinner. You have committed transgression against a perfect and holy God. And because of that, you need a replacement for your sins. You need something to atone for what you've done. Thanks be to God, His Son, Jesus Christ, fulfilled that perfectly. You just then need to recognize Jesus was that atonement. He was me on the cross. I should have been there, and he was. He took all of my sins, put them on his shoulders, died a death that I should have done, and then defeated death by rising from the grave. Because he did that, you can experience forgiveness. But you must accept it. You have to accept it. And not only just accept it, but live it. It needs to be lived If you have accepted that gift of forgiveness, I want to read Psalms 130 to you this morning. If you haven't received that gift of forgiveness, if you're still living in doubt and fear of meeting a holy and perfect God on the day of judgment, listen to this psalm as well, because you can have this. Psalm chapter 130, just listen to this. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than a watchman for the morning, more than a watchman for the morning. O Israel, O Nomberg, O put your name in this place, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel. He will redeem you from all your iniquities. Are you living in forgiveness this morning? Are you walking in victory because of the love and grace and mercy of Christ and the work that he's done in your life? Because it is free. His forgiveness is free. It's given to us freely. It is full. We don't have to question if there's a sin that was covered or if there was one too big. It is certain. He will do it. He is faithful and just. And it's eternal. Because of that amazing forgiveness, there will be a day that we can stand in front of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we can say, all these sins are covered by the blood. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness that we can have through that blood. Lord, we don't deserve any of it. We deserve death. We deserve sinful separation from you. But because of your great mercy, we can have that forgiveness. Father, I ask this morning that as we've delved into this topic of forgiveness, I know we've just scratched the surface, but I ask you that you would reveal to each one of us if we're walking in that forgiveness. Lord, I pray for those here that have not received that forgiveness, that don't understand the magnificent and amazing freedom that we can have in Christ. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work on their hearts. 
I pray that your spirit would begin to show them and minister to them how much they're loved. Loved so much that a perfect, sinless sacrifice, your son, would take their place on the cross, a place that they deserved, just so that they can have freedom and forgiveness. Father, I pray for each one of us here that have experienced that forgiveness. I ask that we would have a fresh and new thankfulness for it. I ask that as we go about our weeks, as we interact with those around us, that we would live and act in love in a place of freedom because of what you've done for us. God, teach us. Mold us and make us and to the people that you want us to be. Help us to be lights. Help us to know you and help us to make you known. Thank you, Father, for this time. And I pray a blessing upon each one here. I pray that as we go into the next part of our service, the next part of our worship, that you would continue to minister to us and just help us to understand more of who you are. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.